official opposition. Today, the House of Commons is reflecting upon the exceptional life of Her Majesty Elizabeth II, Canada's Queen, our Queen, for roughly 70 years. She was our head of state, but also a servant of the Canadian people. She was a model for all those who work for the public service. Us that for all the pomp and circumstance, the real work of governing is not glamorous. It often requires putting aside egos, keeping our heads down, and keeping on with the job. Her humility reminded us that government is not about us. It is about those we serve. We are, indeed, servants and not masters. The Queen had a special place in our hearts, and we had a special place in hers. She spent a more official time here in Canada than in, in any other country save the United Kingdom. She first visited Canada as Princess Elizabeth in 1951. It was on that trip that she said, and I quote, from the moment when I first set foot on Canadian soil, the feeling of strangeness went, for I knew myself to be among not only friends, but amongst fellow countrymen. She would visit Canada over 20 times as Queen, and she was present at so many of our most important occasions. The opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway in 59, the Centennial Expo in 67, the 76th Summer Olympics and the patriation of our Constitution in 1982. As we reflect on Her Majesty's, Her late Majesty's life and her service, we reflect also on the enduring nature of the institution over which she was the crown. On her visit to Canada in 1951, then Princess Elizabeth planted an oak sapling in Vancouver. 71 years later, that sapling has grown into a mighty and stately oak whose canopy provides relief from the sun, or, it being Vancouver, perhaps more likely shelter from the rain. <laughs> the oak tree has long been a royal symbol. It is a symbol of the British Constitution, whose forms we inherited and whose conventions we follow in this House. In Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France, he wrote, the Constitution was a spreading oak tree under whose protective shade the British could peacefully and securely enjoy life as is only possible for those who live under ordered liberty. In Burke's day, the Crown was already a largely symbolic institution. The Civil War had made Parliament supreme more than a century earlier. The conventions of Cabinet were established and similar to what they are now today. But there were voices who thought that it was time to set aside the monarchy. Burke understood, however, that the key to stability, civil peace, and freedom was not to scrap the Crown, but to keep it free from day-to-day -day politics. When each of us entered this place, this Parliament of ours, we entered a place rooted in a historic compromise between Crown and Commoner, a compromise that was forged over centuries through bloody conflict, but also through peaceful evolution. The authority of the Crown may in a sense be fictional, but it is also functional. You see, the separation of symbolic authority from political power allows partisan politics to be contested fearlessly without threatening the enduring constitutional order. Parties and politicians come and go, the Crown endures. The, divi the division of duties, or the org chart, as we might say in workplace lingo, is simple. The Crown preserves parliamentary democracy and the commoners practice it, as we do here in this place. And where does all this come from? Well, it's as least as old as the Magna Carta itself. In 1215, the barons gathered in the fields of Runnymede outside London to confront the king. They were angry at being overtaxed to fund royal adventurism overseas and frustrated by arbitrary excesses of royal power at home. And they were determined to reign in the Crown's authority. The barons forced King John to sign the Great Charter, the Magna Carta, which spelled out the rights and freedoms that the Crown must honour. This was and is liberty under the law. 
Over the next 800 years, those liberties would be gradually extended, improved upon, and given to citizens not only of the United Kingdom, but all of those who inherited British-style parliamentary democracy. Now, though this system is 800 years old, it is only one generation deep. If one generation throws it away, all may lose it forever. And that is why the work of Her Majesty in preserving that liberty and that system is such a treasured gift to us all and to many more yet to come. As Burke put it, it is a partnership between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are yet to be born. We are the living generation, and we have a duty to pass on to our children what Diefenbaker called the heritage of freedom we inherited from our ancestors. This is an, uh, this is an inheritance of all Canadians, not just those of British lineage. I myself am not of British descent, but I recognize this tradition and these liberties are my own, just as did our first French-Canadian Prime Minister, the great Wilfrid Laurier, did more than a century ago. During a visit to France as a Prime Minister in 1897, Laurier noted on behalf of all French-Canadians that there was loyalty to England and France by saying that we are loyal to our great nation that gave birth to us and also to those who gave us freedom. To a French audience that our glory in Canada is that we are faithful to the great nation which gave us life and faithful to the great nation which gave us liberty. And when the Queen spoke at the patriation of our Constitution in 1982, at a ceremony not far from where we stand, where I stand and where all of you sit, Today, she said, the genius of Canadian federalism lies in our consistent ability to overcome differences through reason and compromise. That ability is reflected in the willingness of ordinary people of French-speaking and English-speaking Canada and of, of, of all regions to respect each other's rights and to create the conditions together under which all may prosper in freedom. Dans son premier discours. In his first official speech as king, the King Charles III stated that he was raised in the greatest respect for the precious traditions of liberty and responsibility of our unique history and of our parliamentary government system. Therefore, I would like to congratulate the new King for his responsibilities, and I look forward to serving the Canadian people here in Canada as he does the same thing. It is with a heavy heart, but heartfelt thanks, and with confidence in the future that I say, God speed, Queen Elizabeth II. God save the King, and God bless Canada. Thank you.